introduce you the first speaker with Luca Biferale from the University of Tor Vergata, Rome. Grazie, thank you. Thank you very much. And maybe this has to be switched off? Yeah, probably because it... Let's see. Yes. Thank Ready. you. Thank you for the introduction, for the invitation. Thank you, Giacomo, Sabino. Uh, indeed, I also would like to apologize uh, to Giacomo and Sabino and to all of you because as they know, I will leave. Uh, I will need to leave early uh, today. That I have another commitment, uh, a sort of administrative commitment in Cyprus uh, tomorrow. So, in the afternoon, I, I have to take a flight. And I know that it's very unpolite to leave earlier, but I mean, I, I didn't have any other any other option. So, um, uh, today, uh, I will uh, uh, I will mainly speak about. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm not a cosmologist, uh, and uh, I'm not an astrophysicist. Uh, I work mainly in fluid mechanics, so indeed many many problems are have a big overlap with many cosmological and uh, astrophysical problems. Uh, but today I will mainly speak about methods, indeed, uh, hoping that it it will uh, even be more uh, uh, of a larger interest to the to this heterogeneous uh, audience. Uh, and I will mainly speak about the data. And I mean, I always like to show these two pictures that are, I mean, in some sense, uh, represent very well uh, the status of the knowledge about uh, flows and complex flows that we had 500 years ago. This is the first map ever published uh, about the status of the North Atlantic uh, uh, Sea uh, 500 years ago. It's, uh, it's very interesting to see if you study it that people already at that time had clearly the knowledge that there are uh, highly non-trivial uh, structures and uh, coherent structures that might be present in the in in a, in a complex uh, fluids or complex flows and also you know that is uh, it might be dangerous to navigate uh, in in, uh, in fluids and uh, and this is just to give you uh, the idea of uh, now i mean uh, what what is the state of the art i mean we we have now numerical tools to solve the Navier-Stokes equations, uh, so the primitive equations, so the ground truth, with very high accuracy, as you probably know even better than me. And we have also experimental tools to measure in 3D in the lab the structure of a flow with a very high precision. So we have we have now uh, uh, many data, very precise, and also the equations. Uh, and so the idea is to try to understand uh, this booming of applications and methodologies that have uh, developed in the last uh, five, 10 years, uh, driven by the data, by, the, data, uh, by the, the machine learning community and the artificial intelligence community, how much these tools can be indeed uh, of, uh, can be useful for us. Us means a physicist, working on uh, quantitative uh, problems uh, with quantitative benchmarks and uh, with uh, also the knowledge in many cases of the equation of motions, which is of course uh, not necessarily what happens in many other fields where these data-driven uh, uh, approaches are, are developed, right? So, I mean, in some sense, I mean, at least in my group, let me also present my group, oops. Okay, that's the first. Uh, the first problem. Slides are not. I uh... know ah, it's it's only slow. Sorry, it's only slow. So it's uh, it it is a few years that we we in in, in my group in, in Rome. Uh, uh, not only us, of course, we are uh, working uh, trying to to understand uh, uh, how much these uh, tools. That I mean, any, 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 anyone that has uh, used chat GPT, we, we immediately realize that we have new tools, right? I mean, it's, it's clear that it's going to change even some aspects of our scientific uh, uh, life. And uh, we are uh, strongly involved in trying to understand how much these tools are indeed useful for our community. And uh, we, I mean, uh, at, the, at the moment, they're not very clear uh, understanding, but still. So it's, uh, I will tell you something about, um, as I said, you know, new data driven to uh, uh, what we can, what, uh, what if and how we can use eventually 
these data driven tools in uh, for for uh, for asking uh, questions on uh, complex flows and fluids then i will uh, mainly I mean, try to send a few a few messages about uh, indeed uh, as i say how much we can benchmark in a quantitative way these tools and uh, and uh, and whether these tools indeed allows for quantitative benchmarks and then i mean uh, some important issues that are always uh, 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 that, that needed to be asked, I think, whenever you use black box, uh, almost black box uh, approach about efficiency and explicability. And then eventually also, um, I mean, I will end up by discussing uh, uh, whether indeed these tools might be used to solve grand challenges in our, in our field. Um, uh, I will uh, I will uh, try to approach uh, the problem. Uh, I, I will uh, uh, I, I do not speak in general about the driven tool, of course, because it's impossible. It's too vast. So I will uh, focus on a few applications and then uh, trying to discuss about this application, which is a very important. It's just you know inverse problem. Uh, trying to 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 uh, from some uh, partial observation of your physical objects, uh, try to infer general properties so it's the typical inverse uh, problem you know something you want to know about the, you observe something you want to know more and uh, i will uh, try to discuss different uh, uh, to 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 put uh, this this kind of problem of uh, uh, reconstructing missing information and i will be it will be clear in a few seconds what is the specific application uh, i will try to discuss it by approaching uh, uh, the problem, uh, as we were approaching it until 10 years ago, based on the PDE uh, and on the physics, or eventually in the phenomenology, if we don't have the PDE, as a uh, 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 part of the, of the community working on artificial intelligence uh, uh, is able to do since, uh, I would say, 10, uh, no more than 10 years ago. Indeed, some of the tools that I'm going to present uh, uh, appeared in the literature two years ago, not 10. I mean, this is very fast evolving uh, uh, community, um, order of magnitude larger than ours. And then I will uh, also speak about, uh, this is mainly speculative, about uh, eventually how we can match the two by using this, what people uh, in the community calls uh, physics informed uh, machine learning approach. So trying to take advantage of the equation of motions to constrain the, the machine uh, or uh, uh, vice versa, starting from the equation of motion and uh, supplying, it, supplying it with data-driven data -driven tools. So just to give uh, the context, um, I mean, uh, uh, let me spend a few minutes uh, to for those uh, uh, that do not know too much about, or probably, probably I mean, uh, this is not the case of this audience, uh, why, why, which kind of problems we are interested at, right? So we work on uh, what I call complex flows, uh, complex flows. Uh, typically we speak about the Navier-Stokes equations, right? It is uh, something that has, of course, an impact also on cosmological and astrophysical aspects um, uh, at the minimum because it's a, a strongly nonlinear uh, classical, classical partial differential equation. And uh, uh, the typical, uh, I mean, the Navier-Stokes equations is, uh, can be can be can be applied to many many different uh, uh, contexts, and uh, typically you have a flow described by the, the nonlinear advection uh, uh, diffusive uh, uh, equations, and then in many applications you need to decorate right the backbone by studying, uh, I don't know, it, if, it could be temperature advection and, and buoyancy, so feedback because of gravity uh, on, the, on the flow evolution, or in many astrophysical applications, you might be interested to conducting flows. So you might also be interested to advecting uh, a, a magnetic field and eventually on the Lorentz uh, feedback on the flow. And uh, you may have many, many different possible applications, boundary conditions. You could be compressible, incompressible. In many situations, in realistic situations, you are, you are in particular for planetological uh, aspects, you are interested to uh, cap multi, multi component couplings where you have the flow and particles that are vectored, dust that is advected by the flow. The dust can, can have the same, the same density or different density from the advecting the fluid, 
So you may also have, you know, a couple, the Eulerian and Lagrangian problem, you also needed to solve and to understand the behavior of the whole field and of the quantities that, that are transported uh, uh, by the field. If, uh, if the particles are, uh, the, mass, uh, the mass fraction is important, uh, you may have a feedback even of the particle on the flow. So the situation may be extremely complicated. There is not one problem. There are many, many different problems. I mean, in, in recent years, people became also very interested to active matter. So when the particles are alive, Right? So you, you want to understand the micro swimmers and these are very important influence for uh, oceanic uh, life. I mean, it's, it's, the, the, I mean it's the field is extremely vast, right? I could use this slide to, to present it from biological to cosmological <laughs> workshops. And, but I, what I will speak indeed is on the backbone. I mean, the backbone, the, the, the Bayer Navier-Stokes equations is always there. I mean, all possible applications are decoration on the red, are additional terms on the red, on the red uh, part. So the, the, the red part is this, the Bayer Navier-Stokes equations is always there. And uh, so I will mainly speak about fundamental problems that we do not understand about the Bayer part. So, in, which, 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 uh, uh, so eventually you needed to to, to deal with uh, uh, whenever you're interested in, in any application, for sure, the kind of uh, statistical properties that I'm going to discuss in a few slides uh, are there because they are they are they are uh, given by they are already present in the in the most simplest setup the simplest theoretical setup. You take Navier-Stokes equations. You take, for instance, a Gaussian uh, time in delta Q related external forcing and periodic boundary condition. So something that is the most idealized setup you can imagine. Uh, you already produce a lot of physics that is completely out of control from uh, our understanding. And therefore, uh, eventually, if you are interested to other applications, you need to add the extra complications that comes from the particular applications you, are, you, want, you, you want to start. So what are these complexities? The complexities are at least three. Uh, and of course, sorry, I didn't say, but I mean, I'm of course, speaking about the Navier-Stokes equations, mainly in the limit when they are strongly nonlinear. So mainly in the limit when they develop some uh, chaotic evolution, both in space and time, what people in the community call a turbulent status. And uh, so we, we, we work, okay, this is, I don't know what, anyhow. Uh, so we work in, uh, always, we put ourselves always in, in, in the situation where the flow is so uh, chaotic that indeed the only statistical approach are uh, meaningful. Uh, it, 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 there is no sense, there is no meaning in asking for one particular realization of the flow. The three reasons why the problem is, uh, the backbone problem is stuff are uh, summarized here. The first reason is that whenever you look at the spectral property of a turbulent flow, uh, this is the energy spectrum. So the quantity of energy that you have at, the, uh, at a given wave number shell, uh, you always see in a log log, you always observe a power law behavior. And, and the power law behavior is, uh, is, uh, becomes uh, more and more extended if you increase the turbulent intensity. So if the flow is strongly turbulent, you may easily observe uh, power law uh, energy decaying uh, on uh, three, four, five decades in wave number. Um, uh, the power law, by the way, the power law exponent is uh, out of control from analytical uh, uh, approach. No one is able to prove from Navier-Stokes equations that you should have this observed five-third, celebrated five-third law. This power law behavior, so the fact that you have uh, three decades, four decades, immediately tells you four decades in three dimensions means uh, uh, 10 to the 10, uh, 10 to the 12 degrees of freedom. So we are speaking about uh, statistic fields that have uh, 10 to the to a typical 10 to the 12, 10 to the 10, even larger if you are on astrophysical dimensions, uh, active degrees of freedom. We are not speaking about molecular degrees of freedom, we're speaking about real dynamical degrees of freedom. So it's, a, it's a, an infinite degrees of freedom problem. It's a real PDE. And the second point, which is uh, which makes the problem hard, in particular for data-driven approach, 
is that this power law immediately reflects, if you look at the, at, at the realization in the physical space, in the three-dimensional physical space, having a power law with this slope means that the flow uh, is uh, non-differentiable. And uh, in particular, it's typ the typical increment, it goes like r to one third. So it's a typical realization of an order uh, of a function that has an older exponent, one third. And uh, so it's uh, differentiable only one third uh, in, in, in a one third sense. And uh, immediately understand that this non differentiability, this roughness, uh, introduce problems for any, any you know, data driven. Uh, um, any data-driven approach. The third problem that makes the system even more complicated, uh, which is indeed a really a, a particular feature of turbulence, is that not only is non-differentiable, but if you look at the PDF, so not only at the mean, uh, typical mean square fluctuations, but you look at the whole PDF of the velocity realization, you, you study the, 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 the probability distribution function of the velocity increments at a given scale r, and then you change the reference scale. You're, you have different curves. And going from the, 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 the yellow to the blue, you are decreasing the scale. So you look at scales that are smaller and smaller. Uh, you observe a PDF that is a strongly long Gaussian. This is a log linear uh, structure. So you see that at large scale, you have a parabola, which means it's a Gaussian. So at large scale fluctuations and turbulence are almost Gaussian. But if you look and you look at scales that are smaller and smaller, wave numbers that are larger and larger, the fluctuations become more and more non-Gaussian with very fat tails, right? Here you see, this is a PDF normalized with its standard deviation. You may observe uh, fluctuations that are 40, 50, 60 times the standard deviation. So it's, these are uh, very extreme events. Uh, a random variable that shows a fluctuation 60 times the standard deviation is, is something that is uh, I mean, very far from Gaussian. Um, and uh, uh, again, this uh, this observation is not uh, you cannot prove from an, from from the equation of motion. And please, what says that that depends on the time and force? Because no, that's the good. Uh, that's that's the part of which makes the problem interesting for physicists. Of course, it has a certain scale as well. Uh, um, yes. So the 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 scale where you become Gaussian is the forcing scale. And then the, the way the, the, you deform from Gaussianity to more and more uh, fat tail uh, properties uh, apparently does not depend on the forcing scale. No, no one is able to, to prove it. Hmm? But empirical observation shows that there is a very strong universality. Hmm? This is what makes the problem interesting for physicists. I mean, there is the hope that these uh, properties are universal and therefore eventually uh, uh, um, uh, derivable from the equation of motion. Uh, it's completely out of control, uh, the theory, but it's, uh, it's, the observation is, is a good uh, indication. The fourth um, reason uh, that I do not even show uh, the slide is that it's, this is uh, uh, empirical observation by everybody that the flow is always out of equilibrium. I mean, you need to steer to keep it in motion. Right? It's not, uh, this is nothing uh, Gibson, it's not, has nothing to do with statistical, equilibrium statistical mechanics. If you do not steer, if you do not put energy or forcing, uh, things are trivial, uh, nothing moves, right? So the system is, there is no way to approach it from an equilibrium. Uh, it's a strongly out of equilibrium. Uh, let's say in a perturbative sense, order one always uh, out of equilibrium. So, um, and uh, just to give you an idea, I mean, that's uh, of a real signal. A real signal, if you measure, the, if you follow the trajectory of one particle advected by the flow, uh, this is the velocity, you, you observe things like that. The velocity fluctuates, so you would say more or less in a Gaussian way, right? And then from time to time, the particles starts to to be to 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 be affected by extreme fluctuations. Right? If you well now it's a partially covered. If you measure the derivative of this time things, the acceleration, it's really you, you see from all, all fluctuations order one, you you observe fluctuation order five hundred. It's uh, and if you look again at the PDF of the acceleration, like the PDF that I was showing before, is again a strongly. Uh, with fat tails with the uh, fluctuations on the 56. And, and this is, a, I repeat, a backbone, Navier, pure Navier-Stokes, 
for Gaussian forcing bound by periodic boundary condition. So it's not driven by boundary condition. It's not driven by particular forcing. It's really the nonlinear evolution of the Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, it's uh, present in all possible applications whenever you have a high uh, to strong turbulence. So, um, and indeed, as I said, I mean, I cannot uh, summarize here, but I mean, it's uh, at the moment, the three facts as I showed you before, uh, power low spectrum, uh, roughness of the velocity field, stronger uh, non Gaussian PDF, there is no, no one is able to derive from the equation of motion. It's uh, yeah, completely out of, of, out of control. Um, so it's, I mean, this is just to motivate, it's very long introduction, just to motivate the fact that, I mean, this is a field where you need models. And, uh, and eventually you need the data-driven models if, if, you, if you want to, to probe data-driven models. So what are the data-driven uh, uh, approach that I will briefly discuss, um, which might be of interest for this community? Uh, well, I, I, I call them, uh, you know, uh, inverse or inferring uh, uh, missing uh, information, um, which means that can be declined in many different uh, classes. The, the, the simplest, this is the one that I will discuss, is when you have a partial observation and you, want, you, you know the flow in some points and you want to reconstruct the whole, uh, the whole field. Right. This is typical also in, uh, of course, astronomical uh, astrophysical observation where you cannot measure everything, and maybe you have a model, and out of your model, uh, you uh, from some observation you want to have uh, also to infer invert this this uh, this uh, data to to guess the whole data. Of course, this inversion can be done in in the real space uh, uh, frame or can be done in Fourier. Right. This is what people call super resolution. It is, you know, only some, uh, the field in some uh, wave numbers, you miss, uh, for instance, the high wave numbers. So you have, from, you want to move from a coarse grain image to a very highly, def highly refined image, right? This is a, a simply inferring information in Fourier space. It's exactly the same. Then there are other applications that are very important for our field. That is uh, because of these uh, many degrees of freedom uh, problem, whenever you want to attack numerically the system, you need to reduce the, comp the numerical complexity. So you do not want to solve for all wave numbers. So you need to have a model for what you do not resolve. And uh, which means that you need to infer the physics of what you do not resolve numerically and to have a good model on how to summarize this physics the feedback of the physics on, on, on the degrees of freedom that you are evolving. This is also, uh, it, 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 in some sense, it's a, it's a combination of these, uh, of, these two, uh, of these two aspects. I mean, for instance, all possible engineering applications, uh, whenever you see a numerical simulation of an engineering application, uh, they say that they solve for the Navier-Stokes equation. They do not solve for the Navier-Stokes equation. They solve for the Navier-Stokes equation plus a, a small a, a, a subgrid modeling. And the modeling, of course, can be physics-driven, can be data-driven, can be... Maybe. So let me go back to... Uh, just to give you a few... There is a problem? Ah, okay. So, Grazie. So just to give you a very few spots, to give you the idea of what uh, can be done using state of the, I mean, we do not develop uh, uh, machine learning tools, we cherry pick them. So we see what the community do, uh, does in the, uh, in the most uh, important application and we try to use these uh, tools for our problems. This, this, this project machine learning is it an attempt to understand these puzzles, these statistical properties from the equation of motion? Or what is it about? Uh, there are many different uh, potential uh, um, motivations, right? One very simple motivation is operational. Yeah? Uh, suppose I have a tool that is able to generate. Uh, fields that are realistic in the sense that are undistinguishable from what I measure, right? Uh, uh, then I can use these tools to repair the information that I... Oh, thank you. Uh, 
Still, there is a, is a strange delay. Do you understand why? For a mind, at a certain point, I don't see. Ah, okay, okay, good. So one motivation is uh, very operational. That is, I have a black box that is able to generate, so to replace my equations, hmm? to generate data, then I can use this black box hmm? To, uh, this is what the, the, the kind of application that I'm going to tell you that my that uh, can be used to uh, to refill the information that I miss. Hmm? Another another motivation it it might be closer to what you to what you suggest that is in, in some sense to do a feature ranking. It is to understand what are the key information that you needed to supply to the machine to accomplish the goal. Right in this way. You have, a, you have a way to make some experiments uh, on the importance of the information that you, that, that, that you need to have to accomplish your goal. And therefore you have, an you, have a way to, you have a way to rank these billions of degrees of freedom that at the moment for us are almost all equivalent. It's, uh, it's uh, like to say, okay, uh, in order to control the flow, because I mean, I succeeded to control the flow, uh, I need to act on the, I don't know, strong shear regions, right? Or to the production uh, region uh, close to a wall or to something, right? So this, is, this might be tools, even, even to black box, that allows you, because you can select what you have in input on the basis of what you have in output, these are tools that might help you to understand uh, what is really key inside your inside your uh, your physics? Tools like this can also be used when you do not know the equations to discover some terms. That is, uh, uh, you you see which terms you need to fulfill the the the, the problems. I have to say that this discovering of equations uh, for complex PDEs, up to my knowledge uh, at the moment, uh, has never been uh, successful. I mean, has been successful for very simple um, uh, dynamical systems where the terms that you need to discover are very, are very simple. So uh, uh, just to give you uh, an idea to touch with your uh, uh, intuitions, uh, what uh, 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 this kind of uh, equation based, uh, sorry, data driven based or equation based tools for a very important uh, uh, problem in our field can, can, be, can be applied, right? Um, I, I, I describe here the, the, typical, uh, the typical problem uh, that one might have is that you have some measurements of your uh, complex flow. The measurement is obstructed by something, a cloud, hmm? uh, and you want to reconstruct the information behind. This is what people in the computer vision community do since uh, 20 years ago with many different tools, uh, you know, reconstructing the, this is what Photoshop does when you, you, uh, when you apply a filter, you want to reconstruct uh, something, you miss a high, you want to put the high or a nose and you want to put the nose. Of course, the big difference between uh, our, our community and the community uh, in the computer vision is that we have the equations, right? And we have very clear quantitative, uh, in principle, quantitative, um, uh, uh, ranking tools to understand if your results are correct or not. Yeah? You know that in the computer vision, to ask if an algorithm is successful, they mainly do what is correct to do in that community is to ask people if they are satisfied. I mean, that's, uh, there is no metric, right? It's not clear metric to understand whether the eye, then the nose is the correct nose, right? So what they do, they have a pool of uh, independent uh, observers saying, okay, do you think this algorithm is performing better or, or, or worse? But, uh, of course, I mean, for us, it's very difficult by eyes to say if the statistics here is uh, as the right fat tails, right? So it's, we, need the, we need the more quantitative benchmarks. So I will show you two tools. One, uh, completely data-driven, does not know anything about the equation, could be the face of, uh, of a Brad Pitt. And another, on the other hand, a tool that, uh, only use Navier-Stokes equations, so it's completely it's exactly the two the two different side of the of the moon. 
just to give you an idea of what I mean for uh, reconstructing, here I show you an example. It is a, a flow under uh, thermal instability. So we suppose you have uh, information only on these data points, right? And you want to see how much from uh, the information on these data points you can, uh, you can reconstruct your image. Hmm? Or in the other case here, it, the, 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 the data points, you have information only on the frame and you want to reconstruct what you have in the cloud. I mean, what chat GPT does is exactly the same. What, when you give a, a sentence to chat GPT, you give the frame. You give some data and you ask the machine to fill it, to extend it, to produce something different. So it's exactly the same paradigm. With, of course, a big difference that the natural language is, is, is not necessarily a, a, a statistical and Gaussian uh, uh, distribution. That's you suddenly look at the, the one below the equation base. Is yes. only equation based or the equation plus machine learning? No, at the moment it's only equation based. Only equation. Then I will, uh, I have a couple of slides saying how to join the two. Hmm? Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's a speculative. I mean, nobody did it. Oh, okay. hmm? I mean, people did it on very simple uh, applications. So uh, the equation base, just to give you a setup, what we took, we took Navier-Stokes equations, a very high state-of-the-art direct numerical simulation, high Reynolds, the best we can do, more or less the community can do uh, numerically, uh, solving the ground truth. So we have the ground truth because we solved the primitive equations. Out of this very big simulation, a three-dimensional of a particular flow of interest, the flow under rotation that has, of course, you know, I don't need to explain, it has some uh, clear geophysical interest. We extract a database, so we extract uh, hundreds of thousands of data of planes, for instance. That is uh, the you know the hundred of thousand faces of Hollywood stars that they have in the in the in, in, in the computer vision community in their in their database. And out, out of this ground truth data, we started to corrupt them. We started to we started to mimic some mock, let's say, satellite observations. So we corrupt them. We're supposed to have only one plane. We do not have information on uh, on on some uh, some uh, subset. It could be a, a coherent uh, black a coherent cloud. Could be you know pixel damages. Of course, the two the two even though the the area of the damage is the same, the two as you as you clearly see with your eyes, the two problems are, are different. And and uh, we started to ask how much these state of the art data driven tools are able to reconstruct the, 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 the information. Uh, the tool we used two years ago, it's already out of date. I mean, so I'm showing you results that can be improved now. And, uh, and the tool that we use uh, two years ago is based on this. Uh, this I spent five minutes. I don't know how, much of, how many of you really know about uh, uh, machine learning applications in this field. Um, uh, I spent two minutes to give the idea because it's very interesting. And uh, the idea is the following. What we use is this, what people call uh, nonlinear generative adversarial networks, GAN. Uh, and also they call it context encoder. And the idea is very nice because it's an actor critic structure. It's a competition between two machines. To learn how to generate data inside the gap, what you do, you, you first use, a, a, let's say more or less a standard uh, neural network that is a well, you know, millions free parameter nonlinear fit of the input and you produce some output. This is really I mean for any physicist, very easy to understand, right? It's just you know, a fit of, with, a, with a, a set of parameters could be 10 millions strongly nonlinear, you have some data in, in, in input and you produce some output that is the, 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 the data generated inside. And this machine, this fit is minimized by minimizing a cost. So you, you, you make a gradient descent by changing this parameter, by minimizing a cost. The cost is, uh, is covered. No, it's not covered. Uh, is, uh, the, cost is, the cost is made of two, of two terms that unfortunately one of the two terms is covered. Uh, but I can write it first. No, no, I cannot write because there is no JSON. Um, um, so the cost is the sum of these two terms. And uh, there is a uh, Giacomo, there is no problem because the two, this, the total cost is the sum of these two terms. Hmm? Yes, okay. Uh, but, okay, but I mean, so the first term 
the first time is the one that every physicist would guess, right? It's what is the cost that is proportional to the L2 distance between what you generate, what the feet generate, and the ground truth. So you suppose it is a supervised. You, you need to have, a, 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 do not distract the audience going around. <laughs> yeah, grazie. Yeah. So the first cost is very simple. It's just the L2 distance between uh, what you what you generate, what the feed, the machine generate, the nonlinear fit generate, and the ground truth. So you you have a, you have some data set, you have the ground truth is is a supervised, and you show many many instances, and you try to optimize the parameters to re, to reduce the L two distance. If you do like that, as I will show you later, it's a disaster. So people learned. How to improve these things? I, I, I will I will comment a lot on this. Why I, uh, um, uh, people learned? Uh, I mean, the, the reason why it's very simple is that you know the L two distance is uh, any physicist understand the L two distance is a, is a mismatch between the two energies of the flow, right? because it's, it's the square of the distance. So it's a sensitive only to very big features inside your your field. If you have a field like ours, that is a multi-scale with structure of different intensity, different energy, if you just constrain in terms of these things, you are very insensitive to the small, uh, but very important things that happens inside your flow. You just try to match the, 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 the large scale in some sense, the context. So what people in the community learned to do, in the, in the AI community learns to do, is to uh, to add to this, uh, what they call an actor, this is an actor because produce something, a critic. So they use the output of the, of the first network and they plug it in another network that is a, a, what they call a discriminator, a critic. So it's a network that is a trained such that it receives, sorry, it receives an input, the output of the first and also the real distribution, so the real uh, data sets, right? And the network is trained to, dis to distinguish between the two distributions. It's just a discriminator that in outputs it has a zero or one or something in between. And it is able to say it's, it, the cost is done in such a that it's proportional to the kullback leibler distance between the two distributions. Kullback library distance is a distance that measures how much the probability of the two fields are close. So it does not say anything about a single realization, but is able to distinguish whether the, the, the probability distribution that you measure is similar or not to the one that the data has. And this is very smart because it's, uh, it's in some sense is uh, semi-supervised because even if you don't know anything about the probability distribution of your data, it learns from the examples of the real of the real one. Because when you give it, you tag. You say this is good. This is this is we don't know. This is good. This is, we don't know. So you just try this second network that is then whose cost then is also felt by the first because I say I say to you that the the, 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 the total cost is the sum of the two. One is the L two. The other is the kullback library distance between. Uh, which is which is uh, assessed by this uh, second network between what you produce and what you in, in the ground field. So this uh, adversarial training is able to improve enormously the ability of the machine. Just to give you an example, when you train, uh, you started to uh, you you show hundred thousand images, and you repeated the training uh, uh, many many times, and uh, at the beginning of the training uh, you refill with something that is uh, of course wrong, and then by by increasing the training at the end, indeed at least uh, by eyes, since uh, since uh, it works. Then there is the, the equation based tool. Uh, wow, I'm very slow. Uh, very fast. The equation-based tool is very, is extremely simple. It exists since many years ago. It's extremely simple to understand. It's not the only one. It is uh, the one. It is based on the idea that if you know the equations, then you don't need the training because the equation generates by definition the right statistics. Right. So what you do, you do. Suppose you have one measurement now. Now you don't need the. You have the same problem. You want to refill that particular measurement one. 
You don't need to uh, supervise hundreds of thousand uh, configuration. You need to refill this gap for that particular measure. What you do, you evolve another stokes equations by simply forcing the system, the measurements, I call it uh, VN in red, by forcing the system to be, you evolve the whole, for, the whole flow in the whole three-dimensional domain, and you force the system to be close to your data where you have the data, so in that plane. It's just, you see, a linear uh, relaxation. It's very simple. In this way, in this way, you are sure that if the forcing is uh, strong enough, not too strong because then you have problem, numerical problem, if the forcing is strong enough, uh, the Navier-Stokes equation will be very close to your data where you have the data, and then will refill naturally uh, the rest because uh, Navier-Stokes evolves in the ultra-dimensional flow. So here it's completely equation-based and, 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 and not data-driven. What, uh, what was uh, surprising is that if you compare it, here I show you some results. So you do this training and then you take other fields. You never, yeah. Uh, I think in two, three slides, I can, I can finish it. Um, uh, when you compare the results, so now, now you, 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 you check these, uh, these tools on a new data, never seen. Huh? And uh, here, for instance, I show on this new data, the mean square error. So how, how good you are in refilling the gap as a function of the size of the gap. This is a normalized function. So when you see one, it means the gap is almost complete. It's, you have only one small frame. So you really supply many, 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 uh, very few data. Here I show you, for instance, for a gap that is uh, one half of the total size, for instance, this point. Now, uh, again, it's, it's covered. Uh, um, the, the red dot is the, the machine learning. The, the blue curve is the, 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 the equation base. The results, believe me, even if you don't see it, are identical. The two tools uh, uh, reproduce the mean square error in the same way within error bars. Error bars for the nudging is slightly larger because, I mean, we, because of technical reasons, it is, uh, could be reduced and we, are, we believe it does not change. So at, at, up to this, uh, doing the this, this state best, uh, applying the best uh, machine learning tools, uh, if you have the equations, does not improve the, 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 the equation driven tool. But what I want to comment is, uh, uh, which is I think more interesting eventually, uh, then I will go back to the comparison with the nudging, is the other set of data here, the yellow one, that I call extended the principal orthogonal decomposition, the yellow one is the same result that you achieve for the same problem, instead of using a machine learning approach, using a linear uh, decomposition of your data. What people uh, know until 10 years ago. I mean, until 10 years ago, if you would not use the, the equation, the only other uh, option would be to use a principal orthogonal, principal component analysis. You take your data, uh, you try to decompose in an eigenfunction basis, and you take only the, uh, in reconstructing the data, you take only this, the projection on the eigenfunctions that have the largest eigenvalue. It's what people call principal component analysis in two words. So it's exactly the same machine learning approach, but instead of doing a nonlinear fit, it's a linear fit in terms of uh, eigenfunctions. And again, the nonlinear million three parameter tool is uh, it has the same the same uh, performance. But what is important to understand is that it is true that it has the same performance concerning the L two um, the L two distance. But if you look inside your configurations and you compare the linear data driven approach with the nonlinear data driven approach you immediately realize that the nonlinear data-driven approach is much more, is much richer, even though it has the same distance in L2 sense. When you look, look at this, for instance, at this case, when the gap is very large, you have the linear tool is able to guess the L2 distance more or less in the same way, but the structure that is uh, plugging inside your, inside your gap are uh, uh, definitely, uh, uh, very, very distant from what you have in the ground truth. On the other end, the machine learning approach is very close. That is, the presence of the, 
of the critical part in the in the in the machine learning approach allows it to have a, a, a to, to have a guess that is very close statistically inside your gap in a way that is definitely much better than any other data driven data driven tools so in the case you don't have the equations the nonlinear black box machine learning is definitely better then you can quantify by using by measuring the distance in the probability distribution function and so on and so forth but now i don't have time to enter into these things let me summarize this message and then spending two minutes for the mixed the physics informed approach so we certainly have now new tools that are based on these uh, 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 data-driven uh, approach they have a a few advantages and a few disadvantages. Let us uh, just uh, summarize them. Uh, first of all, are equation free, which is an advantage, an advantage and a disadvantage. It's an advantage if you don't know the equation. It's a disadvantage if you have the equation because, for instance, being equation free, they are not physics comp compliant. You don't know whether you refill it is uh, it respects the basic physics uh, 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 properties. They are data hungry. They need hundreds of thousands of measurements. The big advantage is that once they are trained, they give you the answer uh, uh, in a reactive way. You show the data and they give you the answer. This is very important for many applications. Uh, the other point uh, which I didn't discuss that is connected to the question before is that uh, you, can, you can very easily mix different inputs and therefore you can very easily ask questions about the importance of the physics that you, that you, that you, that you use in the input. The equation-based tools on the other end, whenever you have the equations, of course, you need the equations. They are CPU hungry because to do the numerical simulation, it's extremely, even for one refilling is extremely heavy. Uh, they are very restricted in the inputs in the data that you can supply because it's very difficult to supply data that are very uh, complex. Uh, they have the big advantage, of course, that they are completely physics compliant and, 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 and no training. Uh, which one of the two is best? Uh, there is no there is no answer. I mean, it depends on what you have and what you want to do. That is a certainly, uh, uh, certainly they, they uh, I mean, they, they, they might be very, very, uh, very efficient, but depends on the kind of data that you have. Uh, how many data and the kind of data that you have in your computer. Now, let me give one uh, message and then you can stop about how to join the two approaches. I mean, how do people hope to uh, use data driven and the equation of motions, for instance, to infer uh, some properties that you do not measure? Again, let me just stress when I say infer properties that you do not measure, could not necessarily must be the, 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 the value of the field in one position. Could be the viscosity. You don't measure the viscosity because it's uh, in another planet. And you cannot go there and measure the viscosity, right? Or could be could be many could are a, any could be any uh, physics ingredient important physics ingredients in, inside your inside your problem. Because I mean, of course, depending on the viscosity, you have different realization of the field, right? So uh, these uh, these tools, uh, uh, these uh, equation informed, uh, physics informed uh, uh, machine learning tools, uh, they are based on the following ideas. You have some measurements in some point in time and space of some quantity. And you ask the network to produce what you measure. Here, for instance, is the concentration field. Suppose you measure the concentration field only in some time and only in some points in two-dimensional space. And then you ask the network to reproduce not only what you, what you measure, but also the fields that you do not measure, the component of the velocity, the pressure, and all the fields that you need in the equation of motions. If you are able to do that, the network gives you a guess about all important physical information, then you can back, back differentiate and so estimate not only the fields, but also their derivatives. And so you can evaluate all possible terms that enter into equation of motion. If you evaluate all terms that enter into equation of motion, you can construct a cost that depends on how far you are from the, your measurements where you measure, and also how far you are from your equation of motions. Because you reconstruct the equation of motions and you have an error. If this error is zero, it means that your fields, the ones supplied by the network, 
exactly reproduce navier stokes equation so you train the network to reproduce both the measurements and the equation of motion so you ask your guess to be as close as possible to your equation of motions. If you are able to do that with, with fields that are rough, non-Gaussian, uh, billions of degrees of freedom, and so on and so forth, you put the physics constraints in your black box uh, reconstruction. At the moment, nobody uh, knows how to do it except for extremely simple, simple uh, flow configuration. When I say nobody knows, it's not because they do not know how to do it is that the, the, the machine does not work, does, does not converge, the data are, are too noisy. I mean, it's very, it's very, very cooking part. I think I stop. I, I, do I am, uh, okay, I am two minutes late, maybe only, right? Yeah, yeah I don't know, yeah, maybe. <laughs> okay, so I stop here and then uh, if you have questions, I can, uh, I can uh, answer questions, please. If I'm not mistaken, the pictures are like in stationary statistics. Can you imagine that you may also wonder about transient yes. flow? So, for example, you know, like a bomb explosion, and yes. then you have a whole dynamics that takes place. Yes. And it's not like a stationary problem. Yes. So, is machine learning also doing such things? Yes. Yes. Now you have to make a movie. Yes, yes. Uh, training uh, with a proper training, yes. Indeed, the computer vision community, they insist a lot in saying that when you read the paper, you do not understand exactly, but when they insist a lot in saying that these figures are not stationary, because they are not, homo for stationary, they speak, they are not homogeneous. They, here, they are not homogeneous in space. Your example is a field that is not homogeneous in time, right? So if you have the right training, it is, it is, it is doable. Of course, the big question is the generalizability, I mean, how much you can eventually predict the time evolution. And uh, I mean, uh, here is we are, we are entering in a uh, no one knows uh, area in the sense that it depends a lot on the applications, depends on your training. Generalizability problems of these uh, machines uh, for very quantitative problems typically are not very good, right? But if you look at the chat GPT, you are amazed. <laughs> in the sense that, uh, I mean, uh, it is able to indeed uh, apparently generalize very well. Indeed, it's, uh, it's a fitting in a, a space with an enormous dimension. But I mean, uh, the generalizability is a big issue. It's a big issue for us. In particular, it's very important because, you know, in the equations, you change a parameter and you have the right, the right property. So here, you, you, you need to retrain. Most of the cases, you need to retrain. So maybe this is related to your last uh, slide and comments. Uh, imagine you have your, your set of partial differential equations, you have all the data, and you want to understand, or you want to know whether some terms are there or not, or yes. how much important. This is something that is achievable with machine learning or still quite deep. No, no, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, people... Uh already do it uh, uh, and they do it uh, in the, uh, with a regression in the space of possible uh, uh, partial differential equations, right? And uh, the, the problem again is uh, at the moment, uh, tools are so new that nobody knows how much they are indeed useful in uh, uh, applications that are interesting for uh, research. You see, so I mean, important breakthroughs in open problems, at least in our field, I'm not speaking about other fields, but I mean, in our fields, important breakthroughs, research, knowledge-based based breakthroughs in our field, field of, let's say, complex turbulent flows, using the machine learning, nobody has indeed really supply. I mean, that's, uh, um, it's, uh, I mean, the field is, is too new, to claim a supremacy, let's say, in anything that is uh, really of, of, of real uh, big interest. Then, you know, there are other fields like uh, uh, recently the, the folding of, uh, of, of proteins, right? Where, uh, I mean, apparently, uh, apparently they achieve the supremacy. I mean, they, are, they are better in a very important problem, research-based, they are better to, to predict the folding of a protein than any other previous known, known tools. Oh, you mean there is no particular problem in uh, complex turbulence which uh, 
uh, where machine learning has reached a score no. that uh, no. was not. So no. That's... No. Yes. So it's more asking again an opinion rather than raising the real question. But I mean, suppose you now you have a, a system of particle, so an n body system, and then you can uh, compute integrated quantities such as the number particle number density, velocity dispersion, and yes. velocity and so on. So would it be possible with these machine learning algorithms? So from the time series of the evolution of the yes. integrated quantities uh, to have a guess of their uh, mutual uh, some uh, uh, some sort of effect, guess of effective the, equations. Of effective equations. Uh, I, I mean, uh, I'm familiar with that there is this. And we've done a few numerical experiments yes. with CD, which is like yeah, that, exactly, which yeah, is yeah, it. yeah, and. Uh, but that, I mean, that, you know, uh, it's your first guess is very important. Yes. I mean, you know, if you use the scene, it is this way to regress the, so the, the structure of equations how much do you believe? that are driven. Uh, this is Cindy, I mean, if you use it to, if you apply to Lorentz system, right, you, you, you ask Cindy to discover the Lorentz uh, equations. It's, I mean, three, three, not three uh, yeah. dimensional space. And if you do it by, supplying the right eigenbasis, right? So you ask them to, to guess the equations uh, by combining the polynomials of the, of the variables, yeah. it works, uh, it works uh, perfectly, yeah. right? If you, know the answer. if you know the answer. But if you ask them to reproduce the equations by using a different basis, I don't know, Fourier basis, right? It's a disaster, right? So again, we are, we are uh, here discussing about uh, how much the, the system is uh, is flexible and uh, generalizable, right? And uh, I repeat, uh, I mean, for simple ODEs, it works well. And uh, it's good to know that there are, you know, tools that were not possible to, to be used earlier. Uh, but I mean, for very complex quantitative problems, uh, I still uh, need to see some application that is indeed, uh, you know, uh, back through. Okay. And we're trying, but how it's also so, Yeah, and that's not. Uh, but you know, this I, I repeat. I mean, the, the kind of gun that I showed you before, that is a three. The, the in the literature exists since 2017, so it's five years old. Now, no, now in the, in the machine learning community, nobody uses it anymore. Now, this this the, the big trend is this diffusion model, which is very interesting, by the way, for physics point of view, because it's they invert a diffusion equation. And uh, uh, and so it has many many implications also for statistical mechanics. Now, since the last two years, only only diffusion models are used. No, no, no one uses anymore this uh, this gun. Okay, so I will thank the speaker.